I thought it was time, it was uh, maybe good idea to talk very factually about uh, what these days is being uh, referred to widely as Indian knowledge systems. Instead of talking about, you know, polemically the Indian knowledge systems, I thought I will focus on facts which uh, enable us to understand the dimensions, the character and uh, different aspects, different uh, properties of this domain, what's called India. The first thing I want to say is that after having used this phrase myself since 1975, occasionally I have been rethinking about this phrase Indian knowledge systems and uh, I begin to think that maybe we need to replace this phrase by India knowledge. India knowledge because when we say Indian knowledge, no, that means that there is knowledge which is British, knowledge which is Chinese and knowledge which is Indian because Indian is an adjective modifier. No, we can't really, knowledge is knowledge. So there was one uh, doubt that crept into my mind almost 30, 40 years after I had started using it. Uh, secondly, systems. No, knowledge has only one system. There is no knowledge doesn't have systems. Knowledge typology is another thing. But system, knowledge has only one system. That system is object of knowledge, knower, the means of knowledge, processes of validating knowledge, huh? validating knowledge, and location of knowledge. Where is knowledge stored, located? So this is the system. So maybe it's not really right to say systems. So I'll say that let us start using the phrase India knowledge. One example is that if you go to the site of Chinese knowledge, they call it call that China knowledge. China knowledge. They don't say Chinese knowledge systems and all that. So I think it's a good uh, good shift to describe something as India knowledge. That is knowledge of in India, of in India. The starting point is that uh, the fact that we have a very large body of knowledge texts and a very large body of thinkers and a very long tradition. If this is so because Indian, Indian civilization has from the beginning attached very great value to knowledge. As you know, we have uh, three paths for life, margas. We can, uh, we say that one can follow the path of knowledge, path of action or path of devotion. And a Jnana Marga is the first Marga and those of us who have read Bhagavad Gita, we know that Lord Krishna tells Arjun, first he tells him about karma, action, because Arjun has decided not to act. So he tells him the importance of action, explaining to him that everyone has to do some action, even he an avatara, he need not do any action, but even he has to do action. And uh, inaction is itself a form of action. So the, he first talks about karma, but then he says that the, uh, the action performed without interest, disinterested action, 
this is this is this leads to kind of a sanyasa asceticism and uh, it does not the actions that you do do not bind you but there is another path you can do the action not without you see first is that you do the action without desiring the results the second is you do the action in full knowledge full knowledge that what you are doing does not have the consequences that you are that you are apprehensive about for example killing fighting leads to killing and death that is killing people where you know he explains that uh, what dies is the body and not the self and the body is like clothes and just as we change clothes in the same way in our world view from one life to another there is change so they are both mistaken who think that they have killed and who think that they are killed they are both mistaken so gyana so knowledge has been very core at the very core of indian civilization i have in another place said that indian civilization is knowledge centered from day one and uh, indian culture is value loaded and uh, indian society is duty oriented kartavya parak and uh, indian uh, uh, oneness what makes india a rashtra is a unity of consciousness gyan janit chetanta ki ekatamta gyan janit chetana ki ekatamta the unified consciousness resulting from a deeply embedded knowledge knowledge and uh, the uh, identity the the identity of this Uh, civilization is sanatan that is the one which we don't know when when it started where it is it's a way, a way of life it's not a institutionalized religion sanatan dharma like abrahamic but a way of life it is not god centered as the abrahamic religions are it is a jeev centered life centered all forms of life are equally sacred and the whole civilization is about promoting preserving promoting supporting life life of all forms of all forms and as we all know that uh, in our uh, traditional household the mother the housewife used to make you know used to feed the birds then feed the dog then feed a beggar and feed a brahmin and feed the guest then feed the old people then feed others then children and then herself hmm? yes yes then so yes there is a you ek chapati aap banate hain ek gai ke liye ek dog ke kutte ke liye and etc etc so you know the life centering life centering the idea is jeev centered means that all life forms are equally sacred equally important and they have all legitimate right to exist unlike the abrahamic view where man is comes at the end of evolution and is the best creation and everything else is for him to enjoy this is not so in the indian knowledge centered civilization we say indian civilization is knowledge centered from day one because we have the world's first book we have the world's first poetry we have the world's first prose we have the world's first book of arithmetic we have the world's first book of phonetics we have the world's first book of sociology we have the world's first book of meter we have the world's first book of astronomy 
and one can go on and on and on and on. You see, so knowledge-centered civilization. So now, naturally, maybe because great value was attached to knowledge, because you know texts and traditions must have come after the civilization had been in existence for quite some time. So before it got codified, there must have been a very wide, wide pervasive desire to know and desire to understand not only the human self, but the world around and the cosmos. And because this land was so divinely gifted, gifted with alluvial, you know, land, alluvial soil, almost uh, 2000 miles across and 1500 miles deep, right where the mountains start, stop, you have the alluvial plains. So the food, there was so much of food, so much of sustenance that the society and the people had leisure to think and they wondered, they thought and they wondered about everything. That is the source of. So this desire to know must have been the reason why great value was attached to knowledge and because great value was attached, so this knowledge got codified into the knowledge tradition. How do we say that uh, India is a knowledge-centered civilization? If we remember that in India's history, there has been much vandalism. The universities were, you know, destroyed and the libraries were burnt and all that. Yet, today, we have more than 10 million manuscripts. And this is amazing because I, I, I am subject to correction, but I think having read somewhere that there are 60,000 manuscripts of the Bible. Of course, one reason would be that in the 14th century, they set up the printing presses and they no longer created the manuscripts. But in India, the manuscripts are an alternative mode of recording. They are not because there is no printing, but they provide a different kind of reading experience. So that there is a Tibetan Institute of Higher, there is an Institute of Higher Tibetan Studies, Sarnath. Sarnath is a university of Tibetan studies, where their library is even today a manuscript library. So when there is a new book published, let's say in America or somewhere, they get that book and they convert that book into a manuscript. They prepare a manuscript, handwritten manuscript. And the difference, as I said, manuscript is a is an exercise in, in a knowledge recognition. You cannot make a manuscript unless you understand. And it is also a, a different reading experience. For example, when you read a book, you see the, the amount of nervous energy involved. You see, when we read a book like this and then this and then we turn, and then we turn, our head, you know, moves this and this. And uh, in the computer, now soft copy, it's, it's, it's more taxing because, as say, and then you go there, and then you click, and then you come back. There is a lot of, uh, you know, because when you move your neck, your nerves are moving. Your nerves are moving. So there are a lot of nervous energy. So the possibility of your tiring, tiring is much greater. But a manuscript, when you read from manuscript, you don't move your head at all. You see, like this.
so one of the reasons why our uh, ancients they were able to you know study so much and then of course memorize is this you know this way so that institute today still converts books into a manuscript and they have a library so we have more than 10 million manuscripts that's one evidence there must have been 10 million people who could write who could write knowledgeable people and secondly there is a there is a large large body of intellectual texts in the tradition in fact the even if we look only look at the vedic vangamai you know the let's say take one rigveda then you know for every veda there are samhita a continuous text then it has schools so for example yajurveda has a krishna and shukla yajurveda and then every every school has a corresponding brahman granth a corresponding aranyaka corresponding upanishad or upanishads corresponding pratishakhyas pratishakhyas and no they do no corresponding upavedas but corresponding pratishakhyas and corresponding dharma shastras dharma shastra so you can imagine the large body of vedic vangmay and this all exists in texts in manuscript texts and texts so it's a very large body of and we are not talking we are talking only of the sanatan we are we need to take into account the buddhist canon the tripitaka huge body of literature and we need to take into account the jaina jaina canon which is also huge and these days they are at the jainas uh, have put practically all of their texts on the uh, on the internet so large body of intellectual text in fact the body of intellectual text in a uh, indian knowledge resource languages sanskrit pali prakrit and old tamil is larger than larger than the intellectual text of all the languages of the world combined is larger than that so which attests the great value attached to knowledge we are just giving examples why we say that great value is attached to knowledge and uh, then in several domains we have a continuous tradition tradition of texts and thinkers and for example let's say grammar or philosophy poetics astronomy in each discipline there is a long tradition of texts and thinkers texts and thinkers and schools sometimes schools also for example uh, in poetics there are seven schools unko we call them sampradaya sampradaya and uh, in philosophy we have 16 schools 16 schools of philosophy and each school has a tradition of texts and thinkers each school has a tradition of texts uh is this therefore finally in bhagavad gita in chapter 4 verse 33 and 37 to 38 krishna tells arjun that knowledge is a great purifier mm-hmm. so the metaphor metaphor for knowledge is that knowledge purifies while we are more familiar with the metaphor of the west that we often use that knowledge is power so knowledge is power which is to be exercised exercised to bend nature as descartes said and to bend other people as and other life forms as the genesis genesis says the uh, knowledge is power because it helps you to dominate dominate now here knowledge is a purifier what does it purify it purifies yourself and when your self is purified you also gain power 
it gives you power. So what what Patanjali calls the siddhiya, siddhis. But then these powers are not to dominate others, not to exercise domination on others, but to con- or to exercise control on your own self, own self. So knowledge is power. It gives power, but it gives power in our tradition to control your own self and not others, not others. Now, our culture, we have to ask ourselves, how is it that uh, we have such a large body of uh, literature in the sense, you know, large body of manuscripts, large body of texts, intellectual texts? Because this question is being asked because we are not a bibliolatrous people. We are not a book worshipping people like the Abrahamic civilization, which are book worshipping civilizations. Except perhaps for the Sikhs, who the Sikh system developed in the context of the clash between the Sanatan Dharma and Islam. And so they have Sikh Dharma has elements, Abrahamic. It didn't have but it over period of time it acquired the abrahamic book worship book worship otherwise you know bauddha jaina and sanatan tradition we are not a book worshiping people we are idea worshiping people and that idea take, takes the form it may not take any form it may be idea as idea or the idea can become an idol that you can give the idea a visible form. An idol is simply a visible form, a representation given to an abstract idea. Abstract idea. So idea as idea and idea as idol. So we are idolatrous people, not bibliolatrous people. So we worship the, you know, there is a psychological uh, need for for visualizing things as, as you know in our common parlance if somebody says okay, this is how it happens it has happened as a for example when i told my granddaughter who was four years old that i have read all these books and i remember them she said dikhao you see you have to show like said to huh, visually jaise arjun said virat roop dikhao Even he didn't understand. He wanted to visual, see the idea as an visual, as an idol. And it was that Virata Rupa. So there is a psychological. That is why even in these bibliolatrous religions, you know, the Christian, they, they made the mediator, Jesus Christ, and the largest number of images that you have are the images of Jesus Christ. Although they believe, Christianity believes in a formless one God. And yet the images. And in Islam also, you will find in the auto rickshaws a minar, a minar. Or they will show a woman, you know, with covered head covered, you know, reading something. So, or the arch the Arab architecture, the arch, or the calligraphy, crescent, uh, crescent and the calligraphy, ayat likht hai, calligraphy. So these are all, these show the human need for visualizing the idea, visualizing the idea. So you know, we are basically, idle, and yet we have such a large number of texts, such a large number of texts, now they have been what i what this question implies is that naturally the texts that we have they are not sacred texts they are not religious texts because we are not a bibliolatrous people we don't worship the books so these are not books which are objects of worship and yet we have preserved them and we have preserved them because they are texts of knowledge texts of knowledge and uh, so, preservation not because of sacredness, 
but because of knowledge resource jnan we consider knowledge as sacred as sacred yes knowledge is a i will again avoid the word sacred you know because we don't have a word in our languages which is an exact equivalent of sacred we have a punya punya which is more to do with you know uh, with the abs- absence of any unrighteousness punya uh, it's difficult to translate punya also into english but we have punya kshetra huh? punya kshetra but we don't have a sacred land uh, we don't have sacred land so you have a punya kshetras nine kshetras punya bhumi ha na punya bhumi so where you do the righteous things so it has something to do with righteousness righteousness and not sac- sanctity sacredness uh because uh, although when uh, a cambridge professor translates uh, rigveda into english or vedas they when they talk about vedas they call them divine knowledge divine but there is nothing like divine oh, in indian conception uh, aparusheya is not divine not divine aparusheya i'll come to that typology aparusheya since uh, you have mentioned this now aparusheya is non contingent knowledge knowledge not contingent on an individual as against parusheya 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 so since there is no divinity since we are not a theocentric people so there is no sacredness no sanctity but knowledge has great value because it purifies yourself so the, they have been maintained as knowledge texts this concept of vulgarity has come from the west concept of profane and sacred, sacred and profane the, in in a, in, a, in a, if, if if we had this opposition you will not have the konark temple you will not have the uh khajuraho temples you know and the carvings because for us there is continuity and there is no break between sacred and profane no opposition there no opposition there so the difference however is the when you have a sacred book and when you have sacred books then you do not have the freedom to interpret them the way you want you don't have the freedom uh as you know there is heresy and uh, one is liable to be punished if one moves away from the given the given interpretation and uh, the difference therefore from uh, a, a, a tradition which maintains knowledge as knowledge as one that is uh, uh, texts which are texts of knowledge and maintains texts as sacred the difference is that in the knowledge tradition knowledge tradition the you are free to interpret you have the freedom to interpret free to think and not many civilizations give you the freedom to interpret it is because of this that we have on record that from day one practically coterminous with the vedas this materialist skepticism also arose who doubted the value or the worth or the meaning of vedas themselves who denied in fact actually denied that the vedic mantras have any meaning any meaning no this would not be possible and you know even those people like kots who said that the vedic mantras are nirarthak are meaningless even he is remembered as a rishi as a thinker and yask in his 9th century bc text actually quotes him quotes him so this is the difference between a bibliolaterus value of books and an idolaterus value of texts of texts as texts of knowledge texts of knowledge now i'll quote bhartri hari here who says that the he gives an example of this freedom to interpret in uh, his vakya padya he says that everyone 
from his own predilection creates a system of ideas and each is valid each is valid of course we we do need uh, when there is multiplicity we do need to transcend and find a unifying thread unifying thread so an ekatva buddhi not ek not monism not monistic but a unifying intellect भेद से अभेद सिंथेसाइजिंग और सिंथेसाइजिंग माइंड सो इंडियन थियरीज इन डिफरेंट डिसिप्लिन दे आर ऑल ट्रांसेंडेंटल सिंथेसाइजिंग थियरीज एज अगेंस्ट द कॉन्फ्लिक्ट ओरिएंटेड थियरीज ऑफ द वेस्ट वेयर दिव पैरामीटर इज भेद डिफरेंस वाइल द ऑपरेटिव पैरामीटर ऑफ इंडियन थॉट इज abhed non difference non difference right so and he gives an example of shruti there is a shruti atma deh mai atma deh mai charvakas who are downright materialists who deny the existence of everything except the human body they say they quote this this shruti to show that they are right say look look shruti says the soul atma self that you are talking about is nothing but a permeation of the body body its body which is deh mai it is permeated by the body and the same shruti is quoted by the idealist philosophers who say look look they saying that the deh is permeated by atma permeated by the self is it because as a compound as a modifier modifying relation you can interpret the shruti in the way you want to support your own system to support your own system so people quote the same thing they interpret the same shruti in different ways now this free this is the freedom to interpret which comes from a knowledge tradition now we have talked about a long textual tradition that we have in uh, several domains long traditions of texts and thinkers texts and thinkers hmm? i take an example i'll take the example of the grammatical tradition vyakarana parampara we have it is it is a truth commonly acknowledged that ashtadhyayi panini's ashtadhyayi 7th century bc is the summum bonum of this tradition so we can look at the tradition before ashtadhyayi and after ashtadhyayi mm-hmm. now before ashtadhyayi if we go by vedangas mm-hmm. vedangas vedangas are six vedangas they literally they mean ang of veda sciences auxiliary to vedas sciences necessary to study the vedas right and these vedangas six vedangas out them four have to do with language language so there is phonetics shiksha there is grammar vyakaran there is etymology nirukta and there is chand meter so four sciences four i four auxiliary sciences are the sciences of uh, sciences of language huh? four auxiliary sciences are sciences of language now before ashtadhyayi therefore before ashtadhyayi we had all these four sciences before before uh, you can say uh, before a perfect virtually perfect grammar virtually before the knowledge of grammar was codified in a in a in a core text because we have a system of uh, in each domain of knowledge we have a text which becomes the core text and uh, once you have that text then in the oral tradition it is it makes possible that your memory drops the earlier texts which were not perfect you know you do not keep on carrying the baggage so for example with ashtadhyayi once you had the ashtadhyayi 
there were nine schools of grammar nine schools of grammar but the texts of very other schools other schools were lost were lost in the sense they were dropped dropped because we had a perfect description a perfect description of a human language uh, as near perfect i mean they don't use the word perfect they call it akalaka timeless you see this this grammar uh, explains everything all usage that was that has been that is and that shall be so it's a comprehensive explicit rule bound grammar of a human language and we know now by hindsight that this is the only grammar of a natural human language which is comprehensive explicit rule bound and algorithmic algorithmic uh, i like to quote leonard bloomfield a very eminent uh, 20th century linguist german but resident in america 1934 he wrote the book his language bloomfield and he says that panini's ashtadhyayi is one of the greatest monuments of human intelligence you see so you had this no before before this this book this this text we don't say book we say the composition this composition we have a long tradition of phonetics a long tradition of phonology a long tradition of morphophonemics morphology and then you know rules of grammar because how did this this develop before ashtadhyayi the etymology also how because the need to maintain texts of knowledge ved literally means knowledge ved the word ved comes from the root vid vid means to see this root indo european root is there under the word visual english word visual also comes from vid to see to see and our word for thinker drashta is one who sees to see is to know so from the root vid to know to see to know we have ved so ved is knowledge gyana ved ved exactly means knowledge and uh, the the whole uh, uh, study that the whole the study of different dimensions of the jeev jagat brahman and brahmand all is carried out through language through language so if you want to preserve what has been understood in language that has been stated in language as a text you have to preserve that you have to know the science of language science of language how do you preserve oral texts oral texts oral texts you know which are spoken today the the vedas have come down intact over 5000 years and even today you see vedas vedas are not meant to be read or studied they are not meant to be read or studied they are meant for shravana and for utterance articulation you cannot that's why if you uh, set up a, a university of vedic university where vedas are taught and they are read and then the vedas cannot be understood because vedas are basically articulatory texts because the sound sound has the mantrik hymnal power hymnal power and the meaning of a vedic hymn a vedic hymn lies in the realization of what it predicates it predicates 
and not only in the grasp of what it is saying literally. Literally. That's why the phoneticists, they are called mantra darashtas. They were called mantra people, the phoneticists. And they were very arrogant because they insisted that the correct articulation of Vedas is more important, is important. Not, not, the, not the meaning of the, what, that you have to know the meaning, but if you cannot articulate the mantra accurately, then the mantra will not achieve its purpose, its purpose. So it has to be, it has to be articulated correctly. And since it is sound, it is sound. So the study of sound became the first science to develop in India. Study of sound, which we call phonetics, shiksha. Even today, in, uh, even in BHU, its whole manuscript, manuscript library, there are about 121 manuscripts of shiksha granth. So there are two kinds of phonetics texts available are composed. One is Shiksha and the other is Pratishakya. Shiksha is general phonetics and Pratishakya is phonetics of a particular text. So each school of Rig Veda, there were 21 schools and Shakhas and each Shakha had its own then local recensions. Each recension of a school will have its own pratishakya. Pratishakya. To understand this, for example, English. The way the Punjabis speak English, the way uh, the Karnataka people speak English or Tamil people speak English is different. In the same way, articulation of Sanskrit has regional, you know, local variations. In fact, Raj Shekhar in Kavya Mimamsa, you know, he talks about, you know, the, he says that uh, the, the articulation of uh, uh, Sanskrit in, the, in, the, in Uditya, hmm? Pratya, Pratya is East, Uditya, West. Huh? Am I right? Pratya Uditya? Pratya Vidya is East. Pratya Uditya is West. So he says that the utterance of Sanskrit in the Northwest is Karnakatu. The way they speak. Huh? And it is the Madhya Desha, the Sanskrit of Mag the Magadha se Central India, Vidarbha, which is the example, model. model. So the, this is the point that phonetics takes. Each, each recension of each school has its own pronunciation. So Prati Shakha, Prati Shakya. So Rik Prati Shakya. So there is it still available, Rik Prati Shakya. And each school has its own Prati Shakya. Karnakatu, Jokano me bada. Karva lagta hai sunne mein. Kha, 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 jis mein kha jyada hote hai na. Kharoshti, kharoshti, nami kharoshti hai, joh script hai vahaan ki. To us mein joh sounds hai. You see, classific, if you, it's a whole study. Phonetics, Sanskrit phonetics is a whole study by itself. It has its own tradition. You see, sounds are classified on the basis of articulation. They are classified on the basis of audition, how they are heard. They are classified on the basis of what kind of psychological evocation they do. So, you know, each sound has a color, color, and each sound has a God, has a God. It's very complex. As I said, you know, I have one, one, one article, the color of sounds. Hmm? And uh, which, which is very interesting that you know you have how how can you how can you have a sound and a color correlation? Uh, but speaker, sorry to interrupt you. Speaker called Anand Venkat Raman. Hmm. He is going to talk with us and with CIS Indus, yeah. and he is a neuroscientist in US. Yeah. His whole talk and research is on exactly the same yeah. subject. 
multiple times he mentions that when you see them, uh, just sound, not only color but also forms. Sound also has forms, he says. Forms, yes, yes, because, yes, 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 you see, it's a, because uh, when you, even you make a phonogram, when you make a phonogram, you, you actually see the waves, that is one. But then, you know, you can even visualize if, if sound as a god or a goddess, then you visualize that and you can make a, make a figure, make a figure. So, phonetics has its own study and phonetics is very important because basically, Vedas are not meant to be read. They are meant to be articulated and heard. Shravan ke granth hain, shravan ke, adhyayan ke nahi, adhyayan ke nahi. Isliye, we cannot maintain the Vedic knowledge, Vedic knowledge except in the traditional mode, where Vedas are treated as articulated texts rather than reading texts, reading texts. So there was this dis discipline. And the phoneticists, they had a very great, uh, you know, disregard for grammarians, didn't have much respect for grammarians, because they said that, look, we deal with substance, substance of language, which is sound, and you deal with form, with form. So your study is a secondary study, secondary study. Ours is the primary study. So phoneticist, and then you need, you had phonetics to phonology naturally, because you cannot, uh, each, each sound as article, one sound, as articulated by 10 persons or as articulated by the same person in the morning and in the evening or by the same person when he has no cold and when he has a cold. The same sound has so many forms. Therefore, on the basis of articulation, the Rik Pratishakya says that this vowel A, ah, A, ah, has 2057 forms. 2057 forms. They, Rik Pratishakya has a parameter which modern phonetics doesn't have. The mass of a sound, mass of a sound, you know, bhar. Bhar is the shabd for mass. And in Vaisheshik Sutras, Vaisheshik Sutras, is the same word bhar is used. For what you know, uh, people call gravitation. That uh, the 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 Newtonian Newtonian science says that the earth there is an attraction in the earth and it pulls. But but Kannad says no. Everything has a mass. Mass, and if the mass of an object is more than the mass of the environment, then it will go down. And if the mass of an object is less than the mass of the environment, it will go up. So the same principle explains floating and drowning and flying and flying. So you see, it's the same principle. Uh, but you know, people say that uh, Kannad, in, Kannad invented gravitation much earlier. He's not, he doesn't, his theory is different. So we have to evaluate which is a more adequate theory of the natural phenomena. Ra, la, that ra can become la, is a rule in Ashtadhyay. And uh, isliye, the southern people, the, the southeast people, uh, Cambodia, Thailand, where they call rice lice. What do you eat? We eat lice. Hmm? Lice. Hmm? And, uh, and you know, there is no Tata in Southeast. So there was a monk, the many Southeast monks used to come to study linguistics in Delhi University. And there was this monk who was addressed by, uh, by a teacher, lady teacher, our lady teacher. And uh, she, got, she says, I am annoyed with you. Mary huh? Tumse Kutti. So he said, Madam, I am not Kutti, I am Kutta. 
<laughs> he, he, he thought he, she's calling her him Kutti. <laughs> so he said, I'm not Kutti, I'm Kutta. You know? So this. You mean to say, like in UP and Bihar, they say, Kya chal raha hai, they say, Kya chal raha hai. My, my own son-in-law, वो किसी चीज को खा बोलते हैं छ को खा बोलते हैं मैंने पूखा पूछा नहीं पूखा बट ऑल दीज दीज आर वेरिएशन यू नो बिकॉज दे हैपन बिकॉज ऑफ योर आर्टिकुलेटरी सिस्टम या माउथ के अंदर एंड दे आर ऑल अलाउड रीजनल वेरिएशन है वट दैट किम दंती सेज इज that r l variation is there dialectal variation is there dialectal variation but panini in one of rule says that r sanskrit r is to be pronounced in those days you didn't have a recording you know you could get somebody with a model and record and show he says it is to be pronounced the way saurashtra ki nari pronounce karti hai so the saurashtra women's articulation of r is the standard pronunciation of r in sanskrit how is that i don't know i'm not a saurashtrian nari huh? but it is it has must be i mean in the same way in english you have problems for example we say judge but it is not j english is it j judge judge now this i learned because i had to teach with great effort i used to pronounce and then i would tell the students that now i am going to speak as i normally do judge hmm? but it's not the so the the that's a, it's a remarkable thing it shows you the universe uh, of ashtadhyayi you know and he also talks about uh, kapisha he talks about uh, shava being uh, a verb in afghanistan and a noun in india huh? so shab in a, in pashto means to go and in india it means great going gone dead body you see shab anyways we should not deviate from this that ashtadhyayi preceded by a number of sciences and the the the, the path these sciences were needed because in order to preserve the text maintain the text we had to analyze the text in its parts because a samhita a continuous speech in continuous speech sounds merge one with the other one with the other huh? we don't speak like uh, i a m a b o y we don't speak like that. i'm a boy I am a boy, so I am a boy. I am, I am, I am, I am. So this I, I is I. So somebody who knows, who knows grammar, he will analyze. He will hear this. I am a boy, and he will then say I, and then A M, and then B O Y, B O Y. So to analyze speech into its parts, you need the knowledge of. phonetics knowledge of phonology knowledge of morphology how combinations of sounds form words and how words merge with each other each other morphophonemics so how under what conditions you see for example under what conditions the plural sa becomes za boys but bats bats so this distinction this is morphophonemic so all these sciences developed and they were all part of in a way they were all involved in grammar they are all involved in grammar subsumes study of sound study of combination of sounds into words combination of words into phrases and phrases into sentences sentences and the text which immediately preceded ashtadhyayi 200 years at least before ashtadhyayi is yasks nirukta which is a text of etymology etymology and it is a very important text because uh, the the reason why that text was composed by yask yask was a gujarati from nagarparkar 
because people say om paraskaraya namah om paraskaraya namah i offer my oblation to the gentleman from scholar from Par- nagar park there was a long tradition of skepticism materialist skepticism who in any case believed that the vedic mantras are meaningless because they had many examples where the where the vedic seer repeated himself or where he contradicted himself where he uh, uh, sort of you know uh, sort of said things said things which were illogical or said things which need not be said need not be said for example uh, the example one verse says that do not pile fire in the sky this is a vedic utterance now this they say is meaningless it is because you are proscribing you are asking somebody not to do what in any case cannot be done pile fire in the sky don't pile fire in the sky don't pile fire in the sky so you are proscribing what cannot be done what cannot be done so proscribing what again is meaningless so there is a different kind of meaninglessness you know they were material skeptics were but yask and secondly over period of time 3000 years through change in language because language keeps changing language in in the uh, in the community in the market the speech speech variety keeps changing but when you compose a text from that spoken variety that text is maintained carefully that freezes the text freezes but language keeps changing so a thousand years later many of the words in the composition composition language they become unrecognizable because they are no longer uttered like that the words become unfamiliar or they change their meaning change their meaning for example i will quote to you an 8th century english poem 8th century english poem a an elegy elegy of a dead king oft him anhaga are jabidat do you recognize this as english you know so over over 1200 years 1400 years those words have become anavagata that is the word used by ask not familiar not familiar so you have to you have to know the grammar of that language that language you have to know the history how sounds have changed over time word forms have changed and whether the meanings have also the meanings are often imanaga are ye better often often the the ordinary the ordinary one you know prays for the mercy of god that is the meaning hmm? oft imanaga are ye better oft is often often but it was not often then it was oft so this way two things now one that the materialist skeptics asserted that the vedic utterances are meaningless and they pointed out logical failures the kinds of uh, logical flaws that bhama a poetician in his kavya alankar 7th century book he explicitly says that kavya that poetry must not have logical flaws so they point out logical flaws and secondly over period of time the language changes there are three kinds of changes that yask talks about lop vikar agam some sounds are lost lop some are modified vikar and some new sounds appear intrusion interestingly interestingly in the contemporary transformational grammar 
which is Chomskyan, Chomskyan grammar. The Chomsky has three transformations, three, deletion, addition and modification. They are exactly what Yask in 9th century BC had said. These are the phenomena, operations, processes by which language changes, language changes. So, he started with the assumption, he contradicted the materialist skeptics. But in the true Indian tradition, he first gives the Purupaksha. He reports faithfully Kotsa's 11 objections to Vedic statements. And then he says that their claim that Vedic mantras are meaningless cannot be accepted because no linguistic utterance is meaningless. And as I said, this great uh, assertion became uh, the foundation of Wittgensteinian philosophy of language, you see, 18th century. The no linguistic statement is meaningless. You have to make the meaning. You have to find what you are saying is you do not understand the meaning. But no linguistic similarities. And then he gives answers, you know, the examples that they give. For example, in proscribing the impossible, you see, he gives a very beautiful example. He says that every young mother, every young mother, when she puts her a, a month old child, who can't even turn, a two-month-old child who can't even turn, when she puts the child on the bed and as she moves, she says, don't run away, I am coming. Hmm? Though he says that she is expressing, apart from her deep love, in fact, she is actually seeing this child growing up and running. Hmm? It's not meaningless. So, no, she is also proscribing the impossible. Don't run away. He can't run away. He can't even turn. But she says it. Says so affirmation, affirmation of something. So, you have to understand what it means. So, no linguistic meaning utters. And then, you know, he set about, set about developing a system of interpretation. How to interpret the Vedas. And the whole science of exposition, exposition of meaning, nirvachana, it is roughly called etymology, but etymology only is, you know, one word how it has been uh, uh, formed from a root and prefix, suffix and all that. But this is a science of exposition of meaning, it starts from meaning. How do you fix the meaning of a word? And you have to start from the dhatu, root. Because in Sanskrit, the dhatus are fixed in number, 1057, 1057. And if you think these are too few, huh? because Sanskrit has an immensely large vocabulary. The Deccan, Deccan uh, Great Dictionary of Sanskrit is still on letter A and they have crossed 1 million entries, you see. But because, so... But the roots are 1057. If you think they are small, please remember that no modern Indian language has more than 1000 or 1100 roots. So Sanskrit has 1057, 10, 10, 50, no, no, 1957, 1957 roots, 1957. And Panini, Panini has uh, uh, classified the roots into 10 sets. So he has uh, developed a, a, a morphophonemic grammatical classification of the roots. Roots. So Bhu Satayama. But the important thing is every root has a fixed meaning. Fixed meaning. So when you try to fix the meaning of a word in Sanskrit, you have to first to go to its root. And then you have to see how that root has been modified by prefixation, suffixation and infixation. Infixation. And that is how the word is developed. And each particle, grammatical particle, the prefix and the suffix, each has 
each has a meaning so you know x meaning x pre pre added by a post added by b in added by c and then you get a complex meaning which is the meaning so he fixes the meaning in this way interpret but then in order to show that this is a valid exercise in fixing the meaning then he goes through the entire body of vedic literature and actually takes out examples where that meaning is patently clear even today so it's like you know the oxford dictionary on of an historical principles where in oxford great oxford dictionary the meaning of a word is traced historically and all the other example in 16th century in 14th century in 18th century 17th century so he takes examples from various texts to show the support this this particular kind of meaning so these disciplines at this uh, interpretation shasks and rooks the second century bc it and he also divided the entire vocabulary entire vocabulary of sanskrit language into four sets four sets naam akhyat upasarg nipat what we call parts of speech in english grammar latin grammar which is the model in which english grammars are written ran and martin nesfield they are basically latin model there are eight parts of speech you know english grammar we have eight parts of speech you know vocative and your noun and adjective and adverb and so on so on article definite article and so on but in yask as in sanskrit four parts of speech naam akhyat upasarg nipat that is naam the substantives not noun any nominal expression nominal expression that is any any usage which ends in the nominal in nominal inflection what are in nominal inflections nominal inflections you know for example in english plural marker sa hai right? na and the feminine marker s poet poetess so s and sa these are nominal inflections so there are four there number person gender and case so there are inflections nominal inflection you know any any usage which ends in these is nama so he doesn't distinguish between nominal noun and adjective because both come under the same heading because adjectives are also modified in sanskrit the way nouns are modified you see for example in our languages we say we say acha ladka and achhi ladki in english we don't say good boy and goody girl we don't say that so the adjectives are also marked inflectionally in sanskrit so they come under the category substantive and a great book philosophy of grammar by otto jespersen otto jespersen a book which i think every student of language should read i used to tell my students in uh, jnu it was one of the three or four books i used to say if you haven't read them i will see to it you don't get your ma degree even if you get 70% marks in your examination 80% you see so some books are that were there is a you know warfian benjamin warf ka ek hai language so the warfian hypothesis or yes persons you know this uh, uh, auto yes persons philosophy of grammar and like that so you have parts of speech four parts of speech now why yask directly leads to panini because panini's grammar uses these four parts of speech naam akhyat akhyat is predicate expressions predicates and upasarg are the prefixes ha huh? jaise uh, you know we we is a upasarg gyan vigyan so when you have an upasarg it changes the meaning it changes the meaning upasarg and nipata or all the grammatical particles which are attached to roots and others 
and uh, which do not they are also called indeclinables avyaya jinka kharcha nahi hota jo 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 kharchi hai to wo khatam ho jati hai na change ho jati hai aapki jeb bhi halki ho jati hai so avyaya those elements of language which remain unexpanded remain the same they change don't change their form indeclinables and panini in is ashtadhyayi you know actually because these are finite upsarg and nipat are finite very finite he lists them inside the ashtadhyayi gives a list but for uh, for the verb roots he has a separate text part he is got uh, that part uh, dhatu part and for all the nouns which is a remarkable exercise because uh, endless number of nouns and they are being created every day so he has classified into 254 sets what was it the 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 ghana the the part the ghana part the parthas which are 254 uh, sets for 254 sets of nominals internally that's a matter of detail internally divided also and so on and so on so ashtadhyayi was preceded by lot of linguistic work and there were there were even the non linguistic works also referred to language by facts and of course linguistic texts like parthas part and uh, the uh, the body called lexicons and the shiksha granth and the pratishakha granth and the nirukta granth nirvachanas so they preceded and then ashtadhyayi and ashtadhyayi then was followed by you see the in the tradition ashtadhyayi was followed by first of all by tika commentary commentary now tikas commentaries come in various forms various forms they can be you know simple paraphrase they can be a simple comment or they can be an explanation or they can be an explanation with an example or they can be an explanation with a difference when you differ with that so like that panjika vivarna tika bhasya you have you know eight types of you know commentaries so like uh, ashtadhyayi was commented upon by uh, by uh, katyayana uh, 400 years 500 years after ashtadhyayi was composed katyayana katyayan was a south indian dakshin bharati tha या तो तेलुगु था या कन्नड़ था कन्नड़ था ही रोट वार्तिक कमेंट्स कमेंट्स ऑन पानी रूल्स एंड ही केम अप विद क्रिटिकल असेसमेंट ऑफ फिफ्टीन हंड्रेड रूल्स पतंजलि हु केम थ्री हंड्रेड इयर्स लेटर ही स्टार्टेड विद द असम्पन द नॉट इवन ए साउंड इज आउट ऑफ प्लेस सो कातेन बाई पॉइंटिंग आउट एरर्स इन फिफ्टीन हंड्रेड सूत्रास he has failed to read them correctly so as uh, uh, yask yask did that those people have failed to read the vedic utterances correctly patanjali in his great commentary mahabhashya showed that the rules have to be read in a particular way and he came up with the concept of rules to read rules matter rules matter rules how they have to be interpreted and uh, it was then followed by uh, also recensions that is like chandra vyakarana the buddhist who dropped the textual technical terminology and it was then it was it was followed by what is called the you know reordering because panini ashtadhyayi is a single sentence ek vakyata hai and the same subject is treated at different places then uh, siddhant kaumudi bhatoji dikshit he put it with the change time when you know people were no longer had that uh, that uh, uh, understanding of sanskrit and institutions were shut down so he wrote siddhant kaumudi where in different chapters he all the karak he put together all the verbs verb verb inflections he put together so what was scattered in uh, logically scattered in uh, ashtadhyayi logically scattered he brought together so that to make a, a clear a, at a at a at a simpler level it made more sense that all the rules are put together put together for example karaka 
what do the karakas mean and then how are the karakas represented by vibhaktis then how each vibhakti what form it takes what form it takes so these are three things which are in ashtadhyayi distributed in three places but siddhant comedy they are put together then there were uh, uh, in fact the tradition started even before uh, bhatrudhi dikshit was a 17th century you know 17th century uh, i think he was uh, he was a telugu telugu and but before that roop uh, roop uh, uh, vyakaran of uh, of about 12th 13th century the process started simplified reordered simplified grammars and then 18th century absolutely what are called you know abbreviated texts abbreviated like uh, simplified shakespeare simplified dickens so you had vardaraj ki lagu se dant kaumudi but then it's abbreviated but it's a tremendous text it's now it's almost like you know somebody somebody there what panini did to grammar that vyadi's 1 lakh sutras he deduced to 4000 in the same way vardaraja in a lagu se dant kaumudi he reduced the 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 reordering reordering and uh, reduce the number into a very short you know 18 chapters like 18 uh, 18 bhagavad gita has 18 chapters mahabharat war was 18 chapters and lagu siddhant kaumudi has 18 chapters and it is claimed that depending on your intensity of application you can learn sanskrit grammar in 18 days or 18 hours or 18 minutes or 18 seconds depending on what intensity with what intensity you apply yourself and in the then modern time 19th century on but translations for the katre professor katre's famous translation into english mostly translations into european languages witney translated into english germans translated it into many not only astadhyay many linguistic texts and in 2021st century an important uh, dimension of the study of indian grammatical tradition is the analytical study of ashtadhyayi as a modeling of knowledge and secondly study of ashtadhyayi as an algorithmic grammar in relation to computational technology computational technology how algorithmic you know algorithmically language can be described and in fact people say that uh, uh, people have said that uh, sanskrit is the best language for uh, computer in fact it is not really sanskrit in fact it is the grammar of sanskrit by astadhyayi which in fact when you read and study you feel as if you know some computational person is is doing the job algorithmic job giving nothing to judgment and one thing follows the other and third dimension of uh, you see one is the grammar and grammar and this this the other dimension i would say is the uh, extension of grammatical study into philosophy of language philosophy of language and into language of drama and dance and music this is the extension of study of language so natya shastra bharat natya shastra you know has uh, the language of drama and uh, he relates language to characters how particular characters speak in a particular way and have to be have to be given you know in their tone and their tenor and their vocabulary and their syntax you see depends on this and uh, this this uses uh, very close to what is modern days called stylistics you see stylistic study and then philosophy of language beginning with patanjali and culminating in bhartri hari bhartri hari vakya padya an uh, extensive study of philosophy of language the foundation is grammar so from grammar from uh, from uh, dhvani sounds because ashtadhyayi also begins with 14 maheshwara sutras pratyahar sutras which is simply a listing of sounds ayun ayang ayoj haivarata ya lana jabanj ha jabagad dashabagad like this 
the and the uh, the sounds of sanskrit language are enumerated in the mnemonic 14 sutras so sound to sound to utterance in grammar but in philosophy of language sound to shabd brahma shabd brahma you see akshar brahma what is called akshar brahma akshar brahma and uh, the uh, the view that language constructs the world jagat bhasha ka vikalp hai this world is a is a linguistic construct and secondly jnanam sarvam shabden bhasate all knowledge exists in language in words now this the the vyakarana the grammarian's philosophy differs strongly from the buddhist view of language to so buddhist who said that language does not construct knowledge language in fact is a curtain which prevents the true knowledge of objects because the reality of which the language talks about is momentary and in constant flux and when it is in constant flux and the words being one time utterances fixed in time how can something which is fixed in time capture what is constantly changing so what the words mean what the words mean are not the vastavartha not what actually is but the momentary image of the object that is formed in the speaker's mind in the speaker's mind so for the buddhist language is a curtain language is not the antenna by which you capture knowledge or you create knowledge as the grammarians say so it's very interesting debate between the buddhists and the grammarians and uh, the buddhist saying that the meaning of every word meaning of every word has to be negation there is no affirmative meaning you see and this ultimately they have come from the upanishadic you know neti neti na iti na iti na iti not this not this and that this negation negation is an episteme is a is a very powerful instrument of knowledge is very clear even in the ordinary life ordinary life if a child is taken to a sweet shop he tells her i want to eat something very nice today papa take me to the sweet shop and the father says, this he says no this no this no till he comes to this and if a girl goes to buy her dress and she has something in her mind ki bala light blue aaj khareedna hai and the shopkeeper shows this no 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 something lighter than this no 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 this is too light something darker than this so not this not this not this is a very powerful epistemic mode and the buddhists say there is no affirmative mode only negation but then the vyakaranas there is a there is an attested debate spread over 1200 years between the buddhists and the grammarians finally the buddhists accepted the grammarian's position that there has to be an affirmative meaning because you go on saying not this not this not this not this unless you create a total anarchy anarchy at some point you have to define this to define this and bhama in kavya lankar bhama is a very important poetician in his fifth chapter he starts by saying my oblation to panini and he is a poetician he is talking about literary language and literary meaning to panini and he takes dispute with the buddhist he says the buddhist argue and he argues against the buddhist sir so sir is a deviation ha huh? slight deviation question hai ha huh? what did the grammarians define themselves as on identity they are they are they are called vyakarana but they are vedantins they are vedantins they are vedantins they see themselves as that oh yes as distinct from buddhists yes absolutely absolutely that's why 
Dignaga, Dharma Kirati, Shanta Kirati, great Buddhist thinkers, they are in constant dispute with the grammarian tradition. Grammarian tradition. And it is attested, but the debate is available. But in the process, great knowledge was created. Great knowledge. Yo, ab ye jo negation, Derrida, you know, Derrida. And uh, so you see, Jax, I was saying, Jax Derrida. Ah, Jax Derrida. So Derrida, very popular, you know, deconstruction and uh, itna jada uh, took up the Western world. And the, the, the theory of negation, that is that the meaning is in negation. Nagarjun was a Buddhist thinker. You know, Nagarjun in his Madhyamika Karika, you know, is totally devoted to negation as meaning. That when he was studying in Paris University, in the library, Nagarjun in translation in French was available. Jo Shunyata hai Buddhist ki, Shunyata. Shunyata. What is Shunyata? Shunyata is that you go on and on and on and on and on. No, not this. 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 And because you cannot reach, you cannot really catch hold of the meaning. That is Shunyata. Empty. It's not emptiness. It is an endless pursuit of the ultimate, the ultimate truth, which you may never reach. Which you may never reach. You see? So this, uh, this was picked up and uh, not at that depth, deep level by Derrida in his deconstruction. And uh, one of my very good friends, uh, a very genuine Marxist professor, Professor Pradhan of Seafal Hyderabad, and I'm talking of early 70s, 70s. He and I were very good friends. We were diametrically opposed in ideology, but we were genuine people and not uh, we were not uh, using the ideology as a as a as a mode of means of you know progression or advancement so there was in fact in those days in hyderabad tv they also recorded a conversation between me and uh, pradhan way back so pradhan he did not believe in this deconstruction he is one of his students actually you know took just one sentence and started deconstructing it <laughs> and showed the folly of folly of the whole methodology demonstrated the folly of whole methodology you see that you cannot be that's a, so you come close to bhama who said that bhama who said that the meaning has to be affirmative affirmative and then so i mean uh, lux is a soap you have to know huh? Not that Lux is not an elephant, Lux is not a toy, Lux is not a dog, Lux is not a this. Huh? You got to know. Then, you know, soap, as soap, you may be able to, you know, what is called Swaparyaya and Parparyaya according to Jainas. You see, what are the properties proper to the soap and what are the properties that are not the properties of soap. And the Parparyaya is much larger than the Swaparayaya. So what I am not is a much larger universe than what I am, what I am. So all this debate is made of state part. Now we've been, we've been talking about uh, the, the Vayakarana Parampara, the tradition of grammar. And this was to illustrate our uh, statement made in the earlier session that that Indian, India has a large body of intellectual texts because India has attached great value to knowledge, to great value to knowledge. And one of the evidence of this attachment of great value to knowledge and of building a tradition around knowledge is the fact that in different domains of knowledge, there is a continuous tradition of texts and thinkers. And we just, uh, in the last uh, session, we... Uh, we gave a, a, a taste of, only a taste of the grammatical tradition. Uh, naturally, it's not possible to list all the thinkers and texts because it's a massive body of, massive body of literature. Uh, let us now take, for example, the tradition of texts and thinkers in philosophy. Now, here we are a little more lucky because 
we have what is called in the tradition a sangrah granth a sangrah granth you know just as we have a basic basic primary text like ashtadhyayi uh, we have we have also what are called sangrah granth no in grammar you don't have a sangrah granth a sangrah granth would mean a collection of all the schools of grammar so because but the grammar was a discipline which was logical and shastra ek shastra ek its evolution represented you know in increasing finesse and increasingly deeper understanding of the laws and principles governing language so once you reach the samam bonam text ashtadhyayi all the other texts they were in a way dropped from the tradition because they were seen then as various stages or steps in the final understanding but in the case of philosophy in the case of philosophy it's not a single there is no single world view there is no single point of view towards which all thought you know because it is not the it isn't a, it isn't a monistic abrahamic monistic system that there is only one god and there is only one book and there is only one way of looking at, there is only one truth because the very word darshana darshan is the the view seeing everybody and the philosopher is a drashta seer in english also you have seer one who sees and uh, depending on your point of view your standpoint where you stand and from which background you come everyone sees the same thing in a different way in a different way so in the case of philosophy we have we have a tradition of different points of view and points of view although although uh, the, the, the example that i am going to take why i am saying that it is easier than grammar because we have a tremendous sangrah granth a collection it is sarva darshan sangrah sarva darshan sangrah of madhvacharya madhvacharya it's a uh, you know 14th century text early early 14th century 1300 something madhvacharya and uh, many people say that madhvacharya is the same person as uh, as this vidyaranya very you no know, renowned vidyaranya who was the first shankaracharya founder of the of the shringeri peeth shringeri peeth which was established in 13 14 century and uh, he was the same but people people contest this the vidyaranya is not the same as madhvacharya people but it we are quite we are also we have also have the other kimdanti other legend that madhvacharya was the guru of harihar and bukka who were the two young generals of the kakatiya dynasty the varangal kingdom which was destroyed by tughlaq and when it was destroyed then harihar and bukka under the leadership and guidance of their guru madhvacharya established the vijayanagar empire vijayanagar empire so madhvacharya is the madhvacharya is the composer of sarva darshan sangra it literally means a compendium of all philosophies all darshan all points of view it has 16 chapters you see 16 chapters and it that means there are 16 16 points of view points of view about what about what you observe what you see because reality is both outside you and also inside your mind so reality is the bahirmukhi and also antarmukhi antarmukhi and when the the reality that we talk about is not only what is amenable to the senses but also what goes on inside your mind inside your mind which you can understand only by keeping your eyes shut so 16 points of view i these 16 points of view they begin very importantly they begin with the downright materialist philosophy of a charavaka charavaka uh, the word comes from charu vak that is uh, sweet talk sweet talk which is palatable to the people people love to hear those things 
and they were it was the system was also called lokayata popular among lok among people because he talks about charo charavakas they say this body is the only reality there is no soul there is no god there is no other world this is the only world and this is the reality and once this body is finished everything is finished so there is no past no future no earlier life no later life no rebirth no karma theory no effect of karma do what you like enjoy yourself and i have said popularly was the saying is borrow money and drink shuddh ghee unfortunately there was no scotch at that time otherwise he would have said borrow money and and drink the gold reserve of johnny walker <laughs> the top variety of johnny walker so shuddh ghee piyo and because the, it is the person who lends you money who will worry why do you worry <laughs> the person who lends you will worry so and there but then this is a non serious uh, uh, kind of uh, contemplation but then seriously they they raise some fundamental question they said that you say that a bath in the river ganga you know rids you of all sins then the fish must be completely sinless huh? and if bath in the ganga gives you moksha then they have already got it hmm? and if by diving in the river once and coming out you attain moksha why don't you commit suicide so these statements are not only uttered today they were uttered 5000 years ago also you know a powerful materialist skeptic tradition purnakashyapa jit keshakambali and some others you know and there are some other things that they don't even believe in these relationships father and son brother and sister and all that nothing it's only the body nothing else so very radical materialism and mahatma buddh comes at the end of that tradition but by the time of mahatma buddh the ethical inflection has become very strong so it's not rank materialism it is ethical materialism uh, uh because buddhist ethics like buddhist logic is a is a subject of study even today in all the universities in the world you see buddhist ethics and buddhist on uh, unka jo jitna hai so charavaka the first chapter is charavakas Sorry, and interrupt here how were they still seers how were they still rishis or considered they were considered how? rishis how and how how were they conducting their lives as rishis uh you see they also had also donated in caves there were caves or ha ashoka ajivikas ko ajivikas ko you see the point is that this is the basic basic character of indian intellectual tradition that you are free to think free to think that doesn't mean that they were doing what they were saying the guru says many things but his conduct achar is not necessarily the same that the guru remains a model he is free thinker thinks freely use the possibility ask you to you know recently i, I read yesterday about a man of who has never not taken a bath for 64 years hmm? and purna kashyapa is known for this he said all your all your dukha begins by taking care of your body and the most blatant example of taking care of your body is to have a bath every day or to have a bath naha ke apna phir kangi karna aur phir aise aise karke shishe mein dekhna you see all that so purna kashyap avoided water all his life he would not if he would see a small puddle he will go round it not put his foot into it and i remember my daughter my daughter as a child was very scared of water and one day she was walking with me there was a small puddle and she gave up my hand and she walked around i said you are purna kashyap <laughs> scared of water and when he had to drink water somebody had to pour it in his mouth he would not touch it himself so but he is a 
یو نو اس کی لٹیں بن گئی بالوں کی بٹ دین ہی از کنسڈرڈ اے گریٹ سنگر ایکسیپٹیڈ ایز اے سنگر اینڈ بیکاز دا پاور آف دی تھاٹ آفٹر آل یو کین لاجیکلی پرسیو دی آئیڈیا اٹینڈنگ ٹو یور باڈی از دا بگننگ آف دکھ دا مومنٹ یو 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 سیز ٹو بی اٹیچڈ ٹو یور باڈی دیٹ از دی بگننگ آف لبریشن اس کی ساری ڈائمینشنس دیکھیے گھر بھی اچھا چاہیے بیڈ بڑا کمفرٹیبل چاہیے ہے نا لائٹ بڑی سندر ہونی چاہیے اے سی چاہیے پھر ہیٹر چاہیے گرم پانی چاہیے یو سی دیٹ اور جب کچھ نہیں ملتا اچھی وائف چاہیے اچھے بچے چاہیے ہیں ڈیووٹیڈ فرینڈس چاہیے جب نہیں ملتا تو ڈیزائر ان فل فیلڈ لیڈس ٹو اینگر سیز بھگوت گیتا اینڈ وین یو اینڈ اینگر لیڈز ٹو لاس آف میموری جب آپ کو کسی پہ غصہ آتا ہے تو جو اس نے کبھی اچھا بھی کیا ہوتا ہے وہ بھی بھول جاتے ہو اینڈ ود لاس آف میموری یو گو ٹو کمپلیٹ روئن دس بھگوت گیتا سنو سو اٹس ناٹ دیٹ پورن کشیپ واز آئیڈیلی جسٹ آئیڈلی سیڈ کے کہ بھیا یہ بڑا جو ان فیکٹ ان مائی چائلڈ ہوڈ آئی سین یو نو ایک ریممبر ان آور ٹریڈیشن یو آر ناٹ سپوز ٹو بیدھ نیکڈ ایون ان اے باتھ روم ان آور ٹریڈیشن اینڈ آئی ہیو سین ان ولیجز نو بڈی بیدھ نیکڈ اینڈ اوپن باتھ روم ہوتے دروجے تو ہوتے نہیں تھے ایسے بنا ہوتا تھا ابھی ہینڈ پمپ ہے نہا رہا ہے اینڈ ایف اے ینگ بوائے خوب اپنا صابن رگڑ رہا ہے تو دی فادر گرینڈ فادر سے کی لگا ہے تو اپنا صابن کے سنڈے ہیں ہیں کالے کوے نا چٹے ہوتے بھاویں جنا صابن لگے تو سوچتا ہے کہ تیرا رنگ سفید ہو جائے گا ہیں رنگ یہی رہنا تیرا اٹ واز فراؤنڈ اپون یو نو اٹینڈنگ سو مچ ٹو یور سیلف اٹ واز فراؤنڈ اپون so anyways charvakas the materialist thinkers are the first thinkers in sarv darshan sangra and very interesting madhvacharya in the in the, in the conventions of his indian compositions he begins with a prayer to lord shiva mangala charan he says mangala charan and then he opens the first chapter and his first line is what a great contradiction I have just now prayed to God and here are people who say there is no God. <laughs> and this is the contradiction. And then he expounds their philosophy very faithfully. And so does he give a neutral uh, thing in the whole uh, Sangre or does he give some commentary? No, 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 no. Dikhe Purva Paksha, absolutely objective, objective. And you see the logic is what is. He says their epistemology, the Charavaka said their, their means of knowledge is only perception. Perception. Prataksha. And prataksha mein kya kya? Sari senses aati hain. Jo aap dekhte ho, sunte ho, touch karte ho, feel karte ho. Hmm? They, they don't even believe in, they, they even reject inference, logical inference. The logical inference mein you start with a premise. And your premise, how do you guarantee the, the authority of your premise? All men are mortal. Huh? I am a man, so I am mortal. Hmm? So this premise, so they reject even inference, logical reasoning. And he points out, he quotes, Brihaspati is the thinker. There is no independent Charvaka text available. But Charvaka's principles have been quoted by other philosophers exactly quoted so they are preserved in other texts in other texts so, so, so when people say they you know char vakon ko to khatam kar diya inki kitab mein phad di jala di it's all nonsense they don't know indian tradition kitab mein phadne ka matlab hi nahi hai tradition hi oral hai it's all kept in the mind and just as yaskar 
you know, quotes extensively Kotsa, who says that uh, the Vedic mantras are meaningless. In the same way, Charvakas are quoted extensively by particularly the Jainas and the Buddhists. Because Jain Buddhists are also, they don't also have a God. They don't believe in God. Charvakas don't believe in God. They also don't believe in God. So, uh, the Charvakas, Charvaka people were followers of Charvakas. But people moved away as if the Indian masses are very wise, very intellectual. Because in the oral tradition, the knowledge is distributed by the word of mouth. And all you need is the ear. So people heard all these things. And then the giant thinkers, you know. Because how, what was the, what was, what, what, you know, at what point did Jainas really destroy the credibility of Charvakas? Charvaka said, we believe only in perception. But the Jain thinker said, but they build their whole argument by logical reasoning. <laughs> and that to the Indian mind was a conclusive. You know, reduce that. And the Jainas, Jain and Buddhists are very strong on logic. Jain less than Buddhists. Buddhists are completely logical. In fact, the great contribution, I long back in IIC, when I was a young man about a hundred years ago, and Marxism was at its peak, you know, 80s, mein, you know, early 80s. Mein. Somehow they invited me for on a seminar, you see, of modernity, modern. And there, for the first time, I came up with what I've used very often, that modernity is an incident in the Western history of ideas. It's an event of Western history of ideas. It is an event of the Renaissance, where two shifts took place in the European mind. The mind shifted from God to, from book from God to man, shifted from God to man. The object of study was God throughout medieval Europe. Mon monastery scholarship, monastery scholarship. Great scholars, Marcus Aurelius, Thomas A. Kempis, not mean minds, great minds, but all on the nature of God, nature of man, man's relationship to God, the whole scholarship, Scholasticism jisko kehte hain. It was about God and man. But in the Renaissance, there was the ontological shift. There is shift in the object of knowledge from God to man and epistemological shift from book, book to reason. Book to reason. So you had Francis Bacon, Novum Organum, the text of empiricism. And you have Descartes, on method, the text of rationalism. So rationalism and empiricism became the instrument of knowledge and logic, reason is there in both. Because in the experimental method also, you have to infer. And in rationalism, it is basically reason, reasoning, reasoning. So the modern meant, modern meant that the goal of knowledge is to serve man and the means of knowledge is reason. Now, on both these counts, I said, sir, in IAC, in a distinguished audience, main hall, main, auditorium, main, that the Indian, India's knowledge has always been Jeeva-centric and not God-centric. Huh? And the great contribution of Mahatma Buddha was that he shifted the Hindu mind from ritual to reason. To reason. And we have been therefore perpetually traditional and perpetually modern. Our modernity began. Therefore, modern and modernity are not at all applicable to the Indian reality of Indian situation of ideas. Hmm? In the ideas. So, this Charavakas were followed by 
Buddhists than by Jainas. So the Buddhists, you know, pointed out this contradiction that here are people who claim that they only operate by prataksha but are building their whole discourse by logical reasoning. Reasoning. Hmm? And then, so you have Charavakas, you have Buddhists, then you have Jainas, then you have a Ramanuja system of Sri Vaishnavism, then you have Purna Pragya Darshan of Dvaita Vedanta, then you have Nakulisha Pashupat, then you have Shaivism, then Kashmir Shaivism, then Raseshwara, and then Vaisheshik, and uh, Nyaya, and Mimansa, and Sankhya, and Yoga, and Vedanta, and then in between you also have Panini. Sarvadarshan Sangra treats Panini as a philosopher. So there is a Paniniya Darshan. Paniniya Darshan. Paniniya Darshan led to Bhartri Hari that the whole world is a linguistic construct. Jagat Bhasha ka Vikalpa hai. In a yoga philosophy, Vikalpa is one for the five kinds of knowledge. Vikalpa Jnana. Vikalpa Jnana is that knowledge which is generated, which is produced, that cognition which is created only by words. Words. But, but you won't find that what it denotes that will not be found as a phenomena in the phenomenal world. For example, Shasha Shringa, the rabbit horns, the horns of a rabbit. Now, when you say horns of a rabbit, and if you know a rabbit, you can, can you see a rabbit with horns? You can't see it in your mind. I don't believe it. If I ask you, imagine, imagine na? you can imagine, but you when, when you imagine, you see. What do you mean by imagine? Yes, that's correct. You see. Aapko wo us wo jo horn hai, uske kaise nazar aa rahe hain? Imagination. Oh, hai? White. <laughs> White or soft? Nahi. Haan. Hard like rhinoceros. Rhinoceros. Haan. Thik hai. Because that is another thing, another good point that a word does not, does not give, have, have a fixed meaning. For him, आपको अगर हम कहें कि खरगोश के सींग कैसे होते हैं तो आपके मन में अगर खरगोश का सींग देखो तो किस तरह का देखोगे बड़ा होगा छोटा सा होगा हार्ड होगा कि सॉफ्ट होगा सॉफ्ट होगा वो ऐसे तरह होगा ना ऐसे होगा सींग ऐसे होगा अब दिस डिफरेंस सो देर इज ए यू बट यू कंसेप्चुअलाइज do conceptualize there is something like rabbit horns but you will never see a rabbit with horns in phenomenal world so this is according to yoga vikalpa jnana knowledge generated by language but yoga philosophy said it is one kind perception creates knowledge logical reasoning creates knowledge memory creates knowledge and nidra sleep Abhava, absence is also knowledge. Abhava. If you think that in sleep you don't know, then someday you get up in the morning and say, ah, 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 aaj to itni badhiya neend aai ke koi sapna bhi nahi aaya. That means your cognition, your cognition was working. You see, usi ko nidra ki avastha. Or then uh, uh, swapnil, swapn ki avastha. And then you know the turiya, the bilkul Nirvikalpa, no word, no word, nothing, no concept. Wo aata hai. So, the Vikalpa, but Bhartri Hari went beyond. He said that not only that it is one form of knowledge, language gives one kind of knowledge. In fact, all knowledge is created by language. And the world that you construct is a linguistic construct. ये मुश्किल नहीं है समझना जिस व्यक्ति को हीरे का हीरा शब्द जिसकी वोकेबलरी में नहीं है उसको हीरे की समझ ही नहीं है उसके सामने आप शीशे के टुकड़े और हीरे मिला के रख दो 
उसे कोई हीरा नहीं है पर जो आदमी कहते हैं हीरा तो उसने अपने शब्द से अपने ज्ञान से उस शीशे को हीरा बना दिया हीरा बना दिया ना सो लिंग्विस्टिक कॉन्स्टेंट द होल वर्ल्ड इज ए लिंग्विस्टिक कॉन्स्टेंट भतरी हरी यू नो फ्रॉम फ्रॉम लैंग्वेज एज एन इंस्ट्रूमेंट एनी वेज सो देर आर सेवर नो इज दिस होल सिक्सटीन सिस्टम्स दे मूव फ्रॉम चारवाका टू वेदांता ऑफ आदि शंकरा विच इज इन मॉडर्न टर्मिनोलॉजी पार एक्सलेंस सब्जेक्टिव आइडियलिज्म फ्रॉम मेटीरियलिज्म टू आइडियलिज्म so the movement of ideas in uh, movement of ideas in indian thought is from philo- from materialism to idealism in west it is from plato to karl marx from idealism to materialism so they have degenerated <laughs> or you could say maybe they have improved improved and we have degenerated over right. but then vedanta followed vedanta itself you know they, uh, he hasn't gone into that but vedanta dwait vedanta liya hai inhone ramanuj ka but uh, madhvacharya ka vishishta dwaita na vishishta dwait vishishta dwait liya hai inhone nahi dwait vedanta liya hai ina ramanuj ka liya hai madhav ka nahi liya nimbark ka nahi liya aur balabhacharya ka nahi liya जो वेदांत के वेरिएशन हैं आगे माधवाचार्य ने हाँ थर्टीन से क्योंकि ये निम्बार्क और बल्लभ तो थर्टीन फोर्टीन सेंचुरी के बाद आए ना निम्बार्क शायद उसी टाइम का था बट हिज आइडियाज मस्ट नॉट है स्टेबलाइज आदिशंकर का वेदांत लिया है हाँ वेदांत लिया बट सी ही डजेंट पुट आदिशंकर इज सेवन एट सेंचुरी बट इज पुट ही डजेंट पुट इम यू नो बिफोर रामानुज नो रामानुज इज ट्वेल्थ सेंचुरी अलेवेंथ सेंचुरी ही पुट सिम एट दिन सो द अरेंजमेंट इज अरेंजमेंट इज फ्रॉम इन फ्रॉम हाउ टूवर्ड्स अद्वैता फ्रॉम मल्टीपल मल्टीपलिज्म टू डुअलिज्म टू नॉन डुअलिज्म दैट इज द ऑर्गेनाइजिंग प्रिंसिपल ऑर्गेनाइजिंग प्रिंसिपल एंड इफ यू लुक एट दीज सिक्सटीन सिस्टम्स you can you can classify them into six six the first is material in which you have charvaka buddhist and jaina arhata and the second is you know dualism subject idealism dualistic idealism so you have ramanuj and you have uh, the uh, the purna pragya purna pragya darshan which is tatvavada and the third is the shaiva so nakul nakulish pashupati shaivism and pratyabhig that is kashmir shaivism these three under shaivism and the raseshwara mercurial is, a, is an autonomous system it's an autonomous system where it is it is it is very close to the atomic theory you know that everything permutation permutation of various particles atoms taking form and uh, then the six darshan six darshan uh, uh, they are they they constitute the the fifth one raseshwar fourth one see material one vaishnavism two pashupat teen third fourth raseshwar fifth shar darshan and sixth paninian philosophy paninian philosophy so the whole thing divides into six and the span you can imagine thousands of years thousands of years and thousands of texts take each one and each one its own textual tradition powerful textual tradition